What are some of the differences between uh, Linnan Tiandi and Sin Tiandi in Shanghai? Well, one of the big differences is that the Linnan Tiandi site was actually the heart of the city. I mean, I'm talking about from a social, um, in other words, the, the wealthiest people in this whole region lived on this site. And then they, they were served by a lot of different kinds of merchants, including you know, Chinese medicine, and Chinese wine, and Chinese uh, poet and literature. So it's the, the, the neighborhood that we revitalized, um, very different than Shinten D. Shinten D was one building type. It was basically a, a row house built to house middle class people who supported the rich people of Shanghai. Whereas this place was where the wealthiest people lived and then surrounding them were small shops and medicine shops and other kinds of shops that supported their wealthy lifestyle. So in the heart of this project is a, is a, a magnificent villa that was the home of the guy who um, sold, uh, owned the factory that made double happiness cigarettes, which even today is still a very famous cigarette brand. And of course it means marriage. And then one of the things that entrepreneur did was he, he, he turned one of these fine homes into a marriage house and then he would put up all the guests in other fine homes and so people would I think one of his sideline businesses was to was to have the best place to get married uh, and he was so wealthy that he built a tall building that's about four stories tall that looks like a looks like a fortress and it only has these little slits in the wall where you can point a gun and they had big Iron, it had iron doors with like eight locks and eight different doors to get it. It was a, basically a vertical vault for his gold and his silver and his money. And so that kind of uh, culture heavily influenced the, the way the neighborhood developed. And so it's um, very, very different than Shanghai, which is basically a, a bunch of row houses built by property speculators who have been sold them off just like they're selling off apartments today. So that's, um, and of course the whole uh, Lingnan cultures, it's a much older city than Shanghai. Even the oldest part of Shanghai is, is a, probably a thousand years less old than the oldest part of uh, Foshan. Foshan, people don't hear about Foshan because it's been swallowed up by Guangzhou. But the, long before there was Guangzhou, there was Foshan, birthplace of, a lot of people say it's the birthplace of Cantonese culture, mm. or Guangdong. Mm. And um, certainly where, where martial arts was developed, and it was, the, it was the site of one of the first big temples in China. Mm. And uh, of course, there people from the north of China don't really acknowledge this, but there's really two countries in China, one's south and one's north. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. So if somebody uh, who's, who's not Chinese came to, to Foshan yeah. and uh, wanted to come over to Linnan Tian Di, what, uh, what kinds of things would they do here or, or see or eat that uh, they wouldn't be doing at Xin Tian Di in Shanghai? Well, first of all, for me anyway, and hopefully for all the visitors, it's totally fascinating the spatial framework of this community. It's, uh, it, it wasn't laid out like a city. Like, Shinten D was laid out by engineers, like all the cities of the late 19th century. Uh, it was laid out with transits and you know, tape measures. And this city, because it's probably, people have been living here over a thousand years, this, it's, it's uh, sort of even pre-medieval. Uh, sort of early medieval, uh, where the streets are quite narrow and uh, they curve because the, they were built along the contour lines and they didn't have any way to discharge the waste, so they built next to streams. And that was the sewer. So that heavily affected the way the streets are laid out. So the, uh, and then there's, there's one building type here that's found almost nowhere else in China. And there's a special door that's found. I've never seen the door before anywhere in China. And any, even an hour from here, you can't find this door. And it was developed, I'm sure, by... Um, there was a certain... Uh, because there were so many wealthy people living in close proximity, they probably all 
borrowed ideas from each other. So they developed a very refined building style. And the door sort of uh, epitomizes that because it's three doors. And one is a cafe door where you can see over the top if somebody comes to visit you. Before you let them in, you can have a conversation with them. The second door is actually a concealed door that slides across the opening and it's got big um, wooden bars and so it actually prevents someone from coming in without having to close the big doors. Mm. And it took me a while to figure out why that, why that was. I said, why don't you just close the big doors? Because it has the big three and a half meter tall solid oak mm. Chinese door. And I, then I, it, after I rented a house, I rented one of these houses and I lived there about a year. And I realized that the, the second door is so that you can leave the big doors open and still prevent an intruder from coming in. But then you get all this uh, cool night air that enters the house. And so I think, uh, I think the people that come here will, particularly if they can be told this, and, I mean, I think it's always interesting when you're a, a visitor is to learn something so that is unique. And so if you show a picture of this door, you have a story to tell. And there's, I mean, as the, the longer I've been coming here, which is now almost four years, uh, the more stories I learn. And, um, mm -hmm. I also, you know, there, there's a gable that does this, sort of like a, like a Napoleonic hat. And people, people would say, well, that big curve, they call it the dragon gable, that's just for decoration. And it took me a long time to figure out, not true. Because when you build with wood, the roof, and then you have a neighbor who's building right next to you, those big gables actually follow the flame pattern if your roof's burning. So the, roof, the flames move up the roof and then they peak at the roof, mm -hmm. and so they design those gable ends to keep the fire spreading from one house to the other, okay? So the, 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 the actual shape, so when one person's roof caught on fire, which was not uncommon, because mm -hmm. they all cook inside with a lot of oil mm. and uh, creosote bends up. So the so out of respect for the other neighbor, it became a tradition to build these sweeping gables. And then at some point, people forgot why they were there. Mm. <laughs> and I actually uh, would ask people, I said, "Why is the gable shaped like that?" And they said, "Well, it's always been shaped like that." Mm. But now I know why because fire protection. So what what started out as a very practical tradition became a very cultural, uh, iconic expression. Mm -hmm. And that's, if you look back in history to most of these uh, things that people now think are, are decorative culture, they actually, the vast majority of them have some very practical beginning. And that, that's always fascinates me is when you go to a, when you see architecture that's unique to a place, why? Where did it come from? You know, and so that's, um, very different here than you know the other places I visited in China. Mm. What about food? Well, the food is uh, it's very hot here most of the year. It's subtropical. Um, we're, we're we're south. We're pretty far south, and you know we have palm trees and lush green. You can always tell the climate by the how how lush the green is. You know, and here the green is very green, and which means it's usually very hot. Yeah. So people here have learned to probably, they come out very late at night when everything's cooled down, particularly if there's been an afternoon rain and everything gets cool, and then they come out and they sit on the streets and they eat street food. And we're very close to the ocean here. The river takes you to the ocean. So they eat lots of oysters. And so the first place in China I ever had an oyster, I still can't get them to serve me the oyster raw. And probably wouldn't want to eat it anyway, but mm. in New England I eat raw oysters. But um, here the oysters are, are likely, uh, they, they cook them, they leave them in the shell, and then they put them on a hot bed of coals. And the, the heat comes through the shell. Mm. And then they serve them, you know, almost red hot onto the plate, and then they usually crush a little garlic. Mm -hmm. And then they also have something also that I, you know, when I was growing up in Georgia, in America, we used to have pig roast maybe once a year. We'd roast a big pig in the backyard. And, and one night I asked um, 
I was taking a dinner at a, pig, a roast pig restaurant. And of course, I thought they, I said, no, they don't really roast these pigs. They're probably in the kitchen with a big oven or something. Well, no, the guy said, follow me. So he took me up to the roof. And there were about 10 guys up there with spits, roasting pigs over open flames. <laughs> and uh, so now whenever a guest comes to visit, I try to take them to the roast pig restaurant. And then one night I said, you know, I'm doing this big project and we're going to have lots of restaurants. And, would you be interested in, I was talking to the owner and his wife, I said, would you be interested in uh, joining me for some, you know, for a tour of the project? And, um, and they, they did. Now, and, and then I was inspired by that visit to design a barbecue area, which is totally open air. And it has a, hopefully someone, either that person or someone else will uh, become the person who serves the roast pig mm -hmm. and followed by oysters. And, uh, sweet potatoes and this is very this is not Shanghainese food this Shanghai has a very they pride themselves on being very sophisticated so to, to eat roast pig is probably not maybe roast duck but probably not roast pig not not spit pit roasted mm -hmm. this is sort of like to me it's like the it, you know I grew up in the south in America I grew up in Georgia which is the deep south and the difference between growing up in Georgia and now where I live, where I sometimes spend my summers, is Martha's Vineyard, which is New England. It's the same as the difference between Foshan and, and Shanghai or Beijing. Totally different. Food's different. People talk different. People tell stories with a different inflection. Mm. Uh, people smile at different things. I mean, we all still like food, but um, it's, it's as different as Georgia is to to Massachusetts. Mm. <laughs> mm.